So, you guys, you think we're going to make it through Job? Yes. Glad somebody has some faith here. Okay, we are around Job 4, 5, five actually, 4 and 5, Eliphaz's speech. We're just going to wrap that up. So, um, we haven't taken the time to read all of chapter 4 and 5, which is Eliphaz, the wise old man, who is the first one to speak to Job. But we've already described these guys, that their talks are um, not always correct. Sometimes they have some good things to say, even some things that have become part of scripture elsewhere. But generally, they just have one problem, and that's that their theology is um, lacking. And why is their theology lacking? Well, I believe it's because they didn't really know the God that they were proclaiming uh, in their theology. At least they didn't know him well enough to understand how he works with us. They didn't understand some very basic concepts of God's mercy and forgiveness and love. All they saw was a, uh, a God of justice, a God who uh, pays back for anything that we've done wrong and uh, rewards us only if we do something uh, good. Can you imagine what, the, what your life would be like if God punished you for everything you did wrong? Boy, I couldn't get up in the morning um, look at chapter 5, verse 17. And also if you want to look at verse 18. But ver mainly verse 17. Job 5, 17. Just read that to yourself and see if that sounds familiar. This is, of course, Eliphaz in his sermon of condemnation against Job. And he says these words. Sound familiar to anybody? Now, Blake, I think you mentioned cross-references the other day. Here is a time when you might want to see if you can find a cross-reference somewhere in your Bibles, if you have those. Little notes at the bottom uh, where you might see that. Uh, some Bibles might have that. And if so, it might point to two different places. First, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. And then also in the New Testament, Hebrews 12, 4 through 7. Both of those, so in the Old Testament, in wisdom literature in the Psalms, which comes after this, uh, it is quoted. And then also in, in Hebrews, talking about a parent, you know, God, God disciplines those whom he loves. So there's some truth here that God does um, reprove and discipline the ones he loves. Eliphaz is actually saying something that, that is true. But it is only partly true. One of the points that he does make is that um, what you sow is what, you, is what you're going to reap. And are any farmers here? Okay. You know that. You throw out a certain seed, you know what's going to come up, as long as the seed was what it said on the label, right? What you sow is what you reap. And that is generally true. What we sow is what we reap in nature, in our life, and so on. And so Eliphaz is saying that. Um, basically, you, you get what you, you plant. So that's partly true. But then the question arises, why then did Jesus die? He was without sin. Do we agree on that? I hope so. So where is the justice in that? The wages of sin is death, and Jesus dies. So what do we conclude? Like Eliphaz, well, Jesus maybe sinned. 
or else maybe there is no justice. Well, the biblical answer is in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he, that's the God the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. Jesus died because he, quote, deserved it. Now make sure that you, if you're going to quote me on this, that you take it in context, okay? Uh, God made Jesus to be sin. And so in a sense, or in a very true sense, justice was served on the cross by Jesus, the innocent, dying for us, the sinner. Martin Luther put it even more bluntly. He said, Jesus was the greatest sinner the world has ever seen. Because he took all of our sin on him, and he paid the price with his life. Of course, he was the innocent victim. And so the whole um, sacrifice system is leading up, in the Old Testament, is leading up to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb. Why did they have to take an unblemished lamb to simulate and symbolize as closely as possible their faith in a once-for-all sacrifice that God through the prophets was promising. They didn't see it clearly. They didn't even know the name Jesus necessarily or think of a second person of the Trinity. They just trusted God, a forgiving, merciful, and just God, and all of those fit together, that he was going to supply the, um, the ultimate sacrifice. So. In one sense, Eliphaz had it partially true, even though he was using it as a, a weapon against Job, and he really didn't understand um, that this was referring to God's eternal plan, his plan A to send Jesus for our sins. But it's also partly wrong. I think I heard, uh, I was in my room over there yesterday, and I heard somebody, I think it was Nate, mention about the man born blind. Well, here it is again. Remember the story in John 9. They come and ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Did he inherit that sin from his parents, something they did, and now they're punishing, God is punishing the son? And Jesus said, no, neither had sinned. Surely had sinned, but that wasn't the cause of his blindness. That was the point. And the explanation for the man's blindness is in a completely different category. It says that the works of God might be displayed in him. What word do you associate with the works of God being displayed in somebody? What is God receiving out of that? Glory. Glory. Yeah. How do we glorify God? My simple definition is glor to glorify God is making him look good through our life. That's how we glorify God. He is good. But we want the world to see. They deserve to see that God is good. And so we glorify him by um, making him look good through our life. So it was essentially for God's glory. Eliphaz, another reason for him being wrong is life is not always fair. Example of AIDS. It can be caused by your own personal sin, or it can come from an innocent blood transfusion. Um, when I was younger, living in Monte Carlo, one of the uh, advantages of that was that I um, got to meet some famous people. And uh, I was classmates with the Prince of Monaco, still keep in touch with him. But I'll drop another name here. I was a tennis player. And in my later teens, because I was in the tennis club, I was, I was a ball boy at the Monte Carlo Open Tennis Tournament. All the best players in the world would come to Monte Carlo and play tennis. And anybody recognize this man? Be this is before your generation, but the National Tennis Stadium in New York City is named after him. What's it called? No tennis fans here? Whoa. Ash, Arthur Ash, Ar Ash Stadium in New York City. This is Arthur Ash. He was our best player back in the 70s and uh, that time. And um, I had an opportunity to 
I remember my, even there being at a guardrail, I mean, a, a, a fence over there and watching a, a, a game and he was standing right next to me and we started chatting uh, in English, obviously. And just a really nice guy and very personable and got his autograph and all that stuff. Um, Arthur Ashe. I don't know if you know Arthur Ashe's story, but he became ill later in life. This is at Wimbledon, where after he had won Wimbledon. Um, and he got AIDS from a blood transfusion. And listen to what he says in re reference to that. He says, if I were to say, God, why me, about the bad things, then I should have said, God, why me, about the good things that happen in my life. He's quoting from Job. He's a Christian, was a Christian. He died of AIDS. Not because of any sin on his part, but because of an innocent blood transfusion. So what do you do with Arthur Ashe? I believe he's in God's presence now, and so he has his answer. Okay, so be careful um, to draw conclusions too quickly. So what's wrong with this seemingly sometimes good sermon? It leaves out Christ. And that's the problem with all bad sermons. If the sermon is not centered on Christ and preaching him and his sufficiency, then it's a bad sermon. No matter how interesting, no matter how funny, no matter how many stories the person might tell. Eliphaz didn't understand that Job's story was pointing to Christ. And you say, well, he couldn't have. Well, Job didn't also know that it was pointing to Christ in particular, but he knew that there was something more, that God um, is bigger than our formulas about him. But Eliphaz didn't allow room for anything to change his settled mind and his philosophy. As you look at Job throughout the book, uh, his his understanding of God changed and matured and grew. But Eliphaz, he was set and he wasn't going to change. He didn't allow for the fact that there might be someone greater and more righteous than Job even. He did not leave room for forgiveness, redemption, and the cross. And really, the answer to Eliphaz is the cross of Christ. And we have that, that answer, obviously, in Jesus Christ. And I understand, in God's progressive revelation, they hadn't come to that understanding yet. But if he had been following in a, in a faithful relationship with God, I believe that he would not have jumped to some of these conclusions and criticized Job the way he did. So then... We go to chapter 6 and 7, and Job is now replying to Eliphaz. And let me just read a few verses here. Uh, chapter 6, verse 14. And he's speaking now of Eliphaz um, as he responds. He says, he, in other words, Eliphaz, who withholds kindness from a friend, forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers are treacherous as a torrent bed, as torrential streams they pass away, which are dark with ice and where the snow hides itself. When they melt, they disappear. When it is hot, they vanish from their place, and so on. Poetically, he's saying, uh, you guys are really not good friends. And verses 24 to 27. And now you have to understand that uh, Job, in a lot of what his responses to his friends, he's speaking with sarcasm. My mother told me to avoid sarcasm, but Job didn't. And he, he could get pretty, you know, pretty strong. Teach me, and I'll be silent. Make me understand how I've gone astray. How forceful are upright words. And what does re but what does reproof from you reprove? Do you think that you can reprove Words, when the speech of a despairing man is wind. In other words, your, your words are like wind. And you think that you're going to reprove me with those kind of empty words? Um, you would even cast lots over the fatherless and bargain over your friend. It says, you know, you would bet over 
or play a game or whatever, you know, a, a game of cards with the life of an orphan at stake. That's, you know. Anyway, some of his burning words. So Job points out here that Eliphaz is unkind. He's like a passing storm, a wind with no, no effect. He's self-righteous. He's a windbag. He's a betrayer. And Job basically rejects Eliphaz a simplistic, black and white way of understanding life. There's more to life than this. So, um, and we're going to be moving very quickly through some of this. You're going to have to read this. I'm giving you some pointers so that as you read through Job, you'll get a little bit idea what's, what's going on here. But now we come to Bildad. Oh, wait a minute. I, I'll give you one more slide here. Uh, one big difference between Job and his friends is that Job often pauses and speaks directly to God. I don't see anywhere in all of these chapters where the friends address God. They accuse Job, but they never seem to have their ear to the Lord, nor do they speak and relate to God. So again, that's why I would deduce from, from reading this that they didn't really have a living relationship with, with God. While Job, yes, he will say some terrible words to his friends, but then he'll speak to God. And he'll say some terrible words to God. And then he'll, but he'll continue to talk to God. Job is very blunt and honest. He says that his life is like that of a hardworking slave. My life is without hope. Let me just read a few verses. Has not man a hard service on earth? And are not his days like the days of a hired hand? I'm just a slave. Like a slave who longs for the shadow, you know, for some shade and a hired hand who looks for his wages, so I am allotted months of emptiness and nights of misery. And he goes on and on, complaining about his life, lamenting his life, a life without hope. Then it kind of gets a little humorous towards the end of chapter 7, where you can read the verses later, but he's speaking almost like a young child who packs up his backpack because his parents have grounded him or have ignored him or have done something or haven't allowed him to have the latest Xbox or something. And so he packs up his backpack and he starts walking away from home and he tells his parents, I'm leaving, I'm going, I'm going, you know, and he wants his parents to, to, oh no, don't leave, don't leave, you can have your Xbox. But he's just going to walk away. And watch me, I'm leaving. And in a sense, that's what Job is doing like that. And you're going to miss me. You'll see. But of course, those kids always come back. Um, but Job here is showing that he's a true believer. He's a lover of God. And what I get from this also is that the most difficult pain in life for Job, and really for us, is not the physical pain. It's the sense for Job of being under God's judgment. What does that remind you of? Who does that remind you of? Bible school answer? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. On the cross in the whole week leading up to the crucifixion, it wasn't the impending physical pain, I believe. It was more the emotional pain, the spiritual pain of being separated from his father. And if you read the Gospels, there is much more said about Jesus being mocked by, by the people and suffering that kind of abuse, you know, when they put the, the cross on his head and they, they jeered him and they spat at him and so on. There's much more detail about that than actually the suffering on the cross. Interesting. Could it be implying that that type of rejection of him, even though he had been healing, he had been raising from the dead, he had been preaching uh, freedom and salvation and God's love, and it was all rejected, and they just mocked him and spat at him. That must have been hard to take, knowing that these are the people I love, and look at them like little children walking away. And then he says on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All alone. So it's that loneliness that seems to be much more of a, a pain factor, both for Job and also for Jesus Christ. Okay, 
We're going to keep going. Bildad is the next friend. And he's young. He's arrogant. He has only one point. And he says, does God put justice aside just for you, Job, in chapter 8? Does God pervert justice or does the Almighty pervert the right? And then he says, if your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. In other words, he's saying the reason that your kids died is because they must have sinned. Oh, I'm a father. That would have hurt to hear that because I knew my kids and I was sacrificing for my kids and I was, you know, and then to, to blame them, they should have gotten even worse is what he's saying. Again, same message as Eliphaz, but much more bluntly, you always get what you deserve. Bildad's view is actually the majority view of most religions. Um, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and fake Christianity. It's called karma. I took this off of a, a Buddhist, I think it was Buddhist uh, website. It says this, karma is the spiritual law of cause and effect. Through good acts, you create good karma. And through bad acts, you create bad karma. Very nice formula. For instance, if you have done good actions in your past lives, this lifetime will bring a life of luxury, good health, and happiness. How's that been working for you in this life, guys? Conversely, bad karma from past lives will create problems, suffering, and poverty in this lifetime. All very neatly pack packaged. And you can't disprove it because how are you going to prove that your past lifetime was good? You know? Of course, how are they going to prove it that is bad? So you can't win with this one. But that's karma. So Job replies to Bildad, and uh, sometimes his words are very harsh. But then at the end, after all his words, even his words to his friends, God says to him, does that give me the right to go and say things to our friends like Job? So, um, but why does Job seem to get a free pass? I believe it's because God knows his heart. He knows the heart of Job. And he realizes that his motivations are correct. Um, in my reading here the other day, I came across a passage in Jeremiah 12 that I'd like you to turn to. Jeremiah 12. This is spoken by God through Jeremiah um, to God's chosen people. Okay, so we can put ourselves into this audience here. And Jeremiah, the prophet, was also a very lonely prophet who um, was rejected, like most prophets were, by his people. And he says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. Here again is a prophet of the Lord complaining to God. Seems to be giving us permission to do the same. Yet, I would plead my case before you. And he asked the same question. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them. They take root. They grow and they produce fruit. But then he says this. You are near in their mouth and far from their heart. And that hit me hard. God's word is near in my mouth. I mean, here I am, standing up in front of you, teaching the book of Job. But I wonder if God's word is far from my heart. But you, O oh Lord, know me. You see me and you test my heart toward you. So Jeremiah was saying, you know me. Job is, 
is basically telling the Lord, you know me. And he knows me. But may my, may God's word be near in my mouth, but also close to my heart. Okay, uh, let's turn now to chapter 9. We're just taking some highlights here and there. Verses 32 through 35. Job is now replying to Bildad. And this is what um, Job says of God. For he is not a man as I am, that I might answer him. God is not, you know, physically present here as a person for me to speak to him. That we should come to trial together. He's, he's imagining a court scene, and he's trying to defend himself against the accusations here through his friends that he has done something wrong. There is no arbiter. Do any of you have a different word for that in your, your scripture? Um, there's no mediator, okay? That word mediator is going to come up later too. But there is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. There's nobody to come between me and you. There's nobody to stand beside me to defend me in court. And he's wishing that he would get justice. He trusts that God will do justice. But he needs some help. He needs somebody to represent him, somebody to speak for him. So he's asking, Lord, I need an attorney. There's no arbiter between us. Would that there be an arbiter between us. So he feels all alone in the court of God. And in this sequence here, Job is accepting that God is sovereign. But he's wondering if he's good. Because he's going to have to try to convince God of, you know, he, that he's innocent. And Job isn't looking really for somebody to forgive him. That's not why he needs this arbiter. Because he doesn't admit that he has done any sins that would merit this kind of um, uh, punishment. His point is, I'm right. And I need someone on my side to plead my case. And then he asks, in Job 10, he asks some desperate questions to God. First, he says in verse 1, I loathe my life. Do you know what the word loathe means? Have you ever loathed a person? English lesson? Hate. Hate. Yeah, despise. I despise my life. I will give free utterance to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. He's being very honest. I'm having a hard time. And um, then he asks God in verse 3, Does it seem good to you to oppress, to despise the work of your hands and favor the designs of the wicked? Does it make you feel good that you're attacking me whom you made? I serve you and, and that you bless the, the hands of the wicked? Are you having fun, God? It's pretty... Pretty blunt. Do you enjoy causing me pain? Then verses 4 through 7. Have you eyes of flesh? Do you see as man sees? Are your days as the days of man, or your years as a man's years, that you will seek out my iniquity and search for my sin? Although you know that I'm not guilty, and there's none to deliver out of your hand, quit stalking me. You know that I'm innocent, so why are you coming after me all the time trying to find something? Why are you stalking me? Um, then in verses 8 through 17, he says, Your hands fashioned and made me, and now you have destroyed me altogether. Why in the world did you ever create me if you're now going to destroy me? These are some harsh words to God. Then verses 18 through 22, Why did you bring me out from the womb? Would that I had died before any eye had seen me. Um, why don't you just leave me alone? Let me die. Why don't you just let me die at birth is what he had asked before. Well, I see a sign of hope in these desperate questions 
because he's, he's addressing honest questions to God. He's still hoping in God. Otherwise, he wouldn't be talking to him. So this is really a sign of deep faith. He wants to know. And he's open to know. He doesn't see any sin that has caused all of this. But hey, God, if there is something, let me know. I'm open. So I, I like Job. Uh, he says some harsh things, but um, he's, uh, he's being honest. Okay, then we come up to this third friend, Zophar. He's an angry friend. Um, in fact, in chapter 42, right at the end, God rejects Zophar's words for his anger, and he says to Zophar, my anger burns against you. Whereas here his anger is burning against Job. Well, then God says, well, my anger burns against you, and I trump, I trump your anger. You know? um, so what do we do with Job's words? Do we have any explanation? How come God condemns Zophar's anger, but Job seems to have a lot of anger too? What's the difference? I notice that some of you are having a hard time staying awake. That's a, you know, let's battle through it. Get some coffee. Okay, someone said something here. Is it the heart behind it? I'm asking you. What do you think? Think it's the heart? I think, you're, I think you're right. Yeah. God discerns the heart. And there's an anger that we talked about earlier, you know, a, an anger that is, that is legitimate. It doesn't mean that I mean, what we do with that anger can be sinful, even if it's righteous, a righteous reason for us to be angry in the first place. How we display that anger, how we follow up on that anger can be sinful. And it's, especially for us men, it seems like, righteous anger, you know, we can talk about Jesus overthrowing, you know, the, uh, the money changers' tables and use that, oh, God, Jesus had righteous anger, so we have righteous anger. Well, not very often, at least not in my case. Why are you smiling? Oh, because Caleb ripped my shirt last week, and so Ooh. I was trying to feel about it, and I was saying that was righteous anger. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Practical application there, huh? <laughs> Zophar tells Job in uh, chapter 11 to keep quiet, that he deserves every bit of punishment he has received and more. Burn, angry. Lesson, let's be careful about drawing conclusions about the trials that people are facing, whether it be a torn t-shirt or something else. Um, Okay. Our conclusions are often wrong. Zophar then tells Job he doesn't know what he's talking about. Let me see if I have any. You really should read this. I'm giving you an outline here. You should read this with, with maybe these helps here to pick up on the sarcasm and the strength of what they're saying. Uh, it's poetic language, and so it's sometimes hard. Um, he says, can you find out? Zo um, Zophar says to Job, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? He is assuming that Job doesn't know what he's talking about, but at the same time, he's trying to imply that he knows God's heart. Okay? Be careful about claiming that you're the only one who knows God's mind on an issue. And then Zophar offers a solution. Just repent and pray. Now, what's wrong with that solution in Zophar's case? That's, that's true. I mean, if, if you have sinned, you should repent and pray. So that, in one sense, is a good, good advice. But what's the, what's the catch here? Job hadn't sinned. Job hadn't sinned. What's another catch here? Zophar wasn't ready to repent and pray for any sins that he had committed. 
So be careful about offering a solution that you're not going to follow yourself. Right? Just stop it. You know? Well, how about you stopping it in your life? So some good practical maybe hints for all of us. Um, are we moving fast enough here for you? <laughs> And Job replies to Zophar in chapter 12. I like this. This is really sarcastic. Job answered and said, No doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. I mean, really, that's, that's burned. You are the people, and wisdom will die with you. In other words, you are the start and the end of wisdom. What are we going to do in this world once you die? Because we will no longer have any wisdom. Uh, okay? But then he says, but I have understanding as well as you. I'm not inferior to you. Who doesn't know such things as these? In other words, you haven't told me anything new. He says, I'm a laughing stock to my friends. I who called to God and he answered me, a just and blameless man, I'm a laughing stock. Um, and he goes on. But I love that sarcasm. You think you know it all. And then chapter 13, another, another one. Behold, my eye has seen all this, all that you have said, okay? My ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I'm not inferior to you. But I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue my case with God. And here he's pointing out the difference. You have all these words to say to me, but I'm going to say, my, I'm going to plead my case to God, not before you. As for you, you whitewash with lies, worthless physicians are you all. And then this last verse. Oh, that you would keep silent, and it would be your wisdom. <laughs> your silence is your wisdom. In other words, you have nothing to say. Um, so if you want to throw a zinger at somebody when they're giving you advice, you just quote Job. I'm just quoting the Bible. Your silence will be my wisdom, will be your wisdom. <laughs> okay. Again, I'm emphasizing here it's because Job's heart is right that he complains to the Lord, not because his heart is not right. I'm not sure that can be said about me very often. But here, it certainly is. And I've gone through, probably even you guys have gone through, I say even because all of you are a third of my age or less. Um, but almost all of you. I've gone through experiences where I've been falsely accused. And um, I knew I was innocent of what I was being charged with publicly. And um, it caused a lot of hurt, a lot of hurt. And I cried out to the Lord. And I wished, and maybe I did say some things I shouldn't have said also. In, to the Lord, I wouldn't say that because he knows my thoughts and I should say it anyway and then repent of, of any sinful words. But... Um, also, uh, in public and in private, I said some things, many things, that I should not have said. I was not innocent in that. But when you're being attacked without cause and criticized or, you know, your name is drawn through the mud for no thing that you have done in that particular case, it can be very devastating. And... Um, But he wasn't a wimp. And he never said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, when he didn't have a reason to do that. Sometimes that we do that we just to make peace with, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, that might help tide things over for the time being. But that it's not truth. And if it's not truth, we shouldn't be saying it. 
Job pleads for two things here in chapter 13. He wants a brief time out. He says, I need a break. I'm tired. I can't take this anymore. And then he also pleads to, to the Lord, just talk to me. Let's just talk, please. And again, here might be also some, some advice for us. Okay. Can we continue plowing through? Okay. If you have any questions, you know, to sort of break the, the rhythm here a little bit, please do that. We have a few more minutes before the break, but I understand this is a lot of heavy stuff, and I'm just giving you highlights, and so you're going to have to do the heavy work of following up on this. So, would you say his friends would be like the Pharisees? What do you mean by like the Pharisees? Like the Pharisees were like, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. They were like that to Jesus a lot. And Jesus did a better explanation wrong. Yeah, that might be a good, a good parallel when I think of it and thought of that. They had also their formulas. Mm -hmm. And you just had, you know, there was no, no wiggle room. Mm -hmm. As long as you do this, you're okay. But again, there's no grace in that. There's no forgiveness in that. Um, so there's a lot of similarities there. Yeah. I bristle a little bit when you say Pharisees because Pharisees get, everything gets dumped on the Pharisees. And uh, the Pharisees also did some very good things in keeping... Uh, keeping things, you know, from falling completely apart. And uh, they were, I think, and many of them were motivated by good, good things. But um, the extremes came out, especially when Jesus became a threat to them. Yeah. So. There were some good Pharisees, too. Okay. Next, chapter 16, and here Job is longing for a mediator, again, to argue his case. He's sort of hinted at that before when he asked for an arbiter, and um, let me just read verses 18 through 21. O earth, cover not my blood, and let my cry find no resting place. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven. And he who testifies for me is on high. So somehow he sees a heavenly witness for him. My friends scorn me, and my eye pours out tears to God, that he would argue the case of a man with God, as a son of man does with his neighbor. Did you notice that? He says, my eye pours out tears to God, that God would argue my case, the case of a man, with God. He's asking for God to argue against God. What in the world could that be? Is he possibly, through the help of the Holy Spirit, without even knowing what he's saying, be predicting the mediator, Jesus, arguing our case before God the Father? I don't know, but it cer certainly seems like that might be what he's saying. Even though he doesn't know. He doesn't know there's you know, a second person of the Trinity or anything like that. He doesn't know anything about a Trinity. God is one. That's what all they knew in those days. What does your verse 21 say? That he would argue the case of a man with God, as the Son of Man does with his neighbor. So he's talking about God arguing with God on his behalf. That's certainly what it seems like. And that, to me, is... Wow. Okay. There's another, I'm not sure we're going to get to it, but there's another place where he also sort of imagines a resurrection. And um, where did he get that idea from? Other than the Holy Spirit giving him some revelation, even as he would say these things without even knowing what he was saying, probably. But interesting, anyway. Um, 1 Timothy 2.5, let's just go through this here. 
So only God can see God's, Job's heart and clear his name. And the implication is that the mediator must argue against God, and it seems to be God against God. Is this pointing to Jesus? Or we, we're in 1 Timothy, we, we read that uh, we have one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for, all, for us all. One God and one mediator, and that mediator is God. So, and it's interesting, though, that he's expressing his hope for this mediator in the form of lament. Uh, I mean, the whole portion here is lament. And God is using even his lament to be a revelation of, of the hope that he provides for us through this mediator. So true lament is really an expression of true faith. We talked already about this, the difference between grumbling and groaning. Keep that in the back of your mind. Are you grumbling against God or are you groaning to God? Groaning to God is an act of faith. Grumbling against God is an act of rebellion. Keep those, keep those separate. And yeah, stay away from the grumbling. God doesn't like grumblers. Okay, I think we're going to, well, yeah. We're going to take our break now. Can you come back maybe at five till? We've got still a lot of ground to cover. Okay, good. Take the break. <laughs>